At the studio with Kitchen Theory, we have Dr. Kirill Veselkov. Pleasure a to be here. Sorry? Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you here. So, a computational scientist whose research group within Imperial College focuses on developing machine learning methods that can assist in finding data-driven global health and disease solutions. We're going to be discussing the role of technology within gastronomy, precision nutrition, artificial intelligence, and food waste. So, Kirill, thank you so much for coming into the studio. It's great to have you here. You and I met, I think it was about a year ago, uh, about a year and a half ago, and had an incredible uh, discussion that has led on to um, us collaborating and working together. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but for now, it's amazing to have you here. And I wanted to pick your brain, because at Kitchen Theory, we meet with some incredible people like yourself, and um, we have these amazing discussions, and we wanted to capture them. A hot topic on our minds um, recently, and something that you and I have been discussing an awful lot, is mm -hmm. the role of artificial intelligence yeah. in gastronomy. So let's start off by, I guess, where is AI in the food chain at the moment? Uh, well, first of all, I have to say that uh, uh, the way we met, it's truly extraordinary as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I gave a, a, a keynote on the future of computing, and Joseph gave a keynote on the future of food. And we spent three days in Italy drinking uh, lots of wine and discussing a <laughs> section <laughs> of uh, AI and, uh, and uh, food. And uh, I have to say that that inspired us actually to start a uh, very large scale collaborative project on precision nutrition uh, and particularly focusing on the, the therapeutic uh, yeah. and the cancer preventative aspect of uh, food. And uh, Joseph is uh, now part of our team, so it's uh, <laughs> it's 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 been a really great journey. So now asking uh, un un answering your question about the, the role of AI uh, in modern, uh, not only food but uh, generally digital economy. That currently uh, data is considered a new oil, and you need the yeah. AI tools. Uh, to define and get actionable insights from this data. And I think uh, as part of that nutrition uh, research is uh, just beginning uh, to embrace new uh, AI technologies. And uh, uh, I also have to say that any application of AI technologies actually uh, does require the use cases. And I think uh, therefore, even the way we met, uh, it's, it's, it's quite unique because uh, as a chef, uh, you know what are the demands of food industry and uh, us as data scientists, we can provide solution. But without your inputs and without your use cases, it would be very difficult for us uh, to work with food data. So the future is exciting, but I also think it uh, can be achieved only by uh, team effort. Sure. And so AI is in everything from, let's say, farming right up until how we distribute food, how we, uh, you know, it's now starting to become more and more important in terms of how we consume food, right? And it's interesting to see that in the last few years, especially, there's been a lot more activity within food tech in general. Um, I guess a lot of that is uh, looking kind of online ordering platforms, and uh, there's been a lot of activity there. But do you see that artificial intelligence is it a growing conversation in that community of computer scientists that are interested in applying this to kind of food and nutrition? Well, uh, let's start with precision agriculture. And uh, uh, you mentioned there are so many parameters actually that uh, uh, influence uh, how the food is grown. Uh, and uh, these parameters can be quanti uh, quantified and uh, with the rise of uh, uh, different sensors as well, they can be measured and the data can be captured. Uh, at a scale that never been possible before. And when you have these large volumes of data and uh, you need to interrogate them, when you have hundreds, if not thousands, if not uh, tens of thousands of variables, uh, as humans, it will be very difficult for us to find any patterns. That's why you need machine learning and AI uh, techniques that can uh, literally go through this vast amount of data and to identify some of the predictive patterns that in, you, you, you can use. I mean, that's starting from precision agriculture right down to the uh, personal recommendation for individuals because as an individual, you have certain preference of ingredients, but you also have uh, the genetic predisposition. You mentioned, uh, we discussed before, the microbiome. And all of these generate millions of variables. I mean, that need to be taken into account. 
And any combinatorial uh, problem, when you think about it, uh, it requires a huge computing power and machine learning and AI techniques. So that's why I think, to be honest, the, the future is uh, uh, digital and I think AI driven, but I also want to say that it's not uh, by any means a substitution of a, a chef, uh, for example, but it's augmentation. It's how we can actually yeah. uh, augment AI technologies that would work with you and help you, I mean, to navigate through this uh, vast amount of uh, data to make you uh, to make decisions better when it comes to say uh, in your case uh, designing uh, uh, new types of uh, food or meals well talking about designing new types of food or meals so there's um, one company that stands out that I found really interesting when I was doing the research um, to get ready for this uh, chat and it's called analytical flavor systems they're based in New York and it's an AI driven what they call their product is a gastrograph and uh, they believe that once their model has um, their gastrograph models of food or drink, that it can then simulate what would happen when you change that food or drink's flavor or introduce it to new demographics. And basically what they're saying is that they can help big food companies with uh, more successful launches of new products. Because I guess the point is, it's estimated that 70 to 90% of all new consumer packaged goods fail when they go to market. And this, <laughs> these guys are coming along and saying, well, actually, we can help you through AI modeling. My question is, can AI actually help us with understanding flavor? Can it, make, can it predict something like flavor that's kind of so dependent on the chemical senses? Uh, that's a, a great question, uh, and I think to a certain extent, because uh, as soon as uh, the, uh, you can digitalize uh, information with chemical senses, uh, because uh, any uh, flavor is uh, partially uh, a product of molecular composition uh, as well of uh, um, uh, different molecules, and uh, sometimes it's uh, tens or hundreds of molecules involved in, in, in flavor, and there have been uh, works done in machine learning, uh, uh, including uh, uh, flavor uh, and, uh, and and food pairing uh, to elucidate at molecular level actually what ingredients can be combined together and why from a uh, molecular point of view. But the thing is, um, as we discussed, that flavor is a uh, product also of personal experience yeah. of, of, of your um, uh, body composition, um, potentially microbiome, uh, and uh, and uh, and your genes as well because we perceive food differently, but also environment that where uh, when you eat the food would influence uh, ultimately. Uh, but having said having said that, uh, we also have different countries and different countries uh, um, have uh, different cuisines. I mean, for yeah. example, when it's Indian food, we call Chinese food, and uh, and, and to say uh, Mediterranean food, uh, they all have a slightly different. Uh, uh, not slightly different, but different flavor uh, systems. And uh, therefore, when you design a new product, for example, for China or for India, yeah. uh, you need to take into account the preferences of uh, these uh, people. And uh, from AI point of view, uh, you can uh, once you can simulate uh, the, the, f uh, the flavor and uh, accurately learn it from the existing data, yeah. uh, then potentially you can adapt it uh, so that it would be more successful uh, in certain countries. Not necessarily targeting individual per se, but uh, the beginning targeting population at large, so that it has, say, Chinese flavor versus Indian flavor, for example. Yeah, versus. so kind of flavor profiles, uh, cultural likes and dislikes, and being able to tweak and adapt the product so that it will appeal to certain markets um, based on kind of their, their, yeah. their palate and their preferences. Yeah, because we can, uh, from even ingredient composition as a chef, you know that, uh, uh, and I, in fact, in your studio, uh, when uh, we had the dinner together, that you presented some of the Japanese food, for example, yeah. and they have slightly different uh, flavor and preferences of ingredients compared to other uh, cuisines. And uh, so this is uh, just one example where you can take that into account because yeah. it's partially reflected in the in the history uh, of uh, the... So AI could help us with developing foods that we, or uh, tweaking the flavors of products. I still think there's going to be a lot of people out there who say, though, that there needs to be uh, that human element there, that tasting panels will um, in some way reflect uh, more of a... Uh, real view, but I guess the point is with AI, you can ca you can look at much larger 
amounts of data yeah. than you can through getting people into a testing panel, right? Or a tasting panel, because you're dealing there with maybe a few hundred people versus with, um, you know, looking at larger data, there's a greater chance, I guess, of being able to develop something that for mass markets works really well. Well, let me, and, for, and, and, and first of all, for uh, tasting panels, you also need to have experts that uh, sometimes uh, require to study for, 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 for many, many years. Let me just give you one example with wine industry, for example. I mean yeah. that, um, a good friend of mine, he studied for four years uh, for uh, wine uh, tasting. And, uh, but now we can uh, measure uh, the uh, metabolic composition of the wine, for example, hundreds of molecules. Uh, we can get a profile of the wine and we can use uh, AI and machine learning techniques to differentiate which is a, a good one or not a good one from a molecular composition. So in the future, we can use these experts to train the system. And once you've trained the system, uh, then you can take a new bottle of wine, get a molecular profile and see whether it belongs uh, uh, so are we it. saying that we could completely get rid of wine and food critics and just replace them with yeah. AI and maybe we could make better estimations of restaurants that people would like based on an AI uh, uh, machi learning machine going into a restaurant and analyzing the menu? If it was only that simple, <laughs> so I would have agreed with you. But as you mentioned, taste is also uh, a perception. It's yeah. not uh, only the composition and molecular composition of what you eat, but it's actually how it interacts uh, with your body composition and the environment you are in. Uh, and sometimes you can have exactly the same uh, food, um, but aesthetically it's different, or you're in a different company and you can perceive it differently. So if it was not that simple, but uh, having said that, uh, if you want to introduce some objective measures, yeah, uh, then uh, one way of uh, doing it, it's uh, uh, using uh, molecular phenotyping uh, technologies, uh, getting molecular profiles, and uh, then... Um, well, talk us through that. What's molecular profiling? So molecular profiles, say, if you take uh, a wine uh, sample, and uh, now the modern technologies such as uh, mass spectrometry or nuclear yeah. magnetic resonance uh, uh, spectrometry uh, allows you to basically take the sample and in untargeted fashion uh, measure uh, hundreds of molecules uh, of uh, of metabolites, for example, low molecular weights uh, that are partially um, responsible for flavor. Okay. Uh, and uh, based on the distribution of these uh, molecules, that's uh, how you get the color, you get the taste. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah. uh, once you can uh, measure them and you have some metadata, for example, uh, where the wine comes from, then you can find the patterns uh, that would predict uh, certain uh, properties of, uh, say, wine. Uh, but you can, the same approach can be applied with uh, any food. So you can, and in fact, as part of uh, our own research, as you know, we are collaborating with the um, uh, group from University of San Diego, Professor Peter Dorstein and uh, Dr. Alexander Aksonov, who provided us about 2,500 uh, samples uh, of different uh, uh, foods and uh, food samples that they measured using this uh, analytical uh, technology. And each of the sample contains uh, measured uh, a thousand, a couple of thousands of molecules. Okay. And uh, the amount of data generated is huge, and actually. So then uh, that would allow us to uh, interrogate it and see how, for example, uh, even different cooking uh, methods would influence the molecular composition. Uh, that would influence the nutritional value, that would influence the flavor, that would... This is okay. it. This is it, because ultimately any cooking process, I mean, it changes the... See, this is really interesting, because you hear in the news all the time about superfoods, right? And this idea, and we've, we've discussed this before, this idea that you've got um, certain foods that are said to be really good for you, really healthy, uh, have different... Um, uh, could be cancer-beating properties or whatnot. But we have no idea on how those foods um, are once you've processed them, right? So, I mean, cabbage uh, can have nine different types of cancer-beating molecules, but that really depends then on where you've got the cabbage from, um, how it's been stored, how it's been transported, how it's been processed. And then finally, as well, who's actually consuming it, right? So there are all these variables, and I'm guessing AI can help us take 
that whole spe all those different variables into consideration when we're making food choices. Yeah, and I have to say that the process is, is very complex indeed. It does depend on molecular composition, where the food comes from, how it's been cooked, as you said, how it's been processed, how it's been stored. So all these parameters indeed, I mean, uh, influence a uh, composition, and there is uh, and experiments are quite expensive to do. Yeah. So that's why uh, in this space, uh, definitely machine learning and AI technology would help us to navigate and select uh, um, uh, optimal uh, processes. And one of uh, the developments in this space, I think personally, would be uh, natural language processing, yeah. particularly because a well, lot of just explain what natural language processing well, is. Natural language processing is uh, the uh, machine going through lots of literature and uh, uh, extracting uh, the data uh, related to uh, the problem that you're interested in. So, in kind of layman's terms, it's like giving a machine every paper that was ever written on nutrition and asking it to look for certain um, experimental evidence. Experimental uh, evidence based on what it is that you're looking for and it being the machine being able to obviously read far more literature than any one person could do and come out with a more accurate result, right? Uh, it's not necessarily accurate, more accurate, because of course when you give it to the expert, I mean the expert would provide you an accurate, um, more accurate results on yeah. a given paper. But given that we currently have, say in cancer research, every paper published about 10 minutes and if you're a good scientist, you can read a paper a day. Uh, then <laughs> at the scale that we're talking about, uh, it's just not uh, possible. And I think uh, one of uh, the future directions, I think, uh, for scientific community, how to make paper not human readable, but machine readable. So this machine oh, wow. can, can read it and uh, extract the metadata. Uh, because currently, uh, the majority of scientific knowledge, unfortunately, accumulated in unstructured form, in textual data. Uh, okay. But uh, the problem is that sometimes you give the same paper uh, to, to two uh, experts and two individuals and they can interpret the findings differently. Uh, and okay. I think uh, this is a, a, a big problem because then it's very difficult to, to um, uh, aggregate uh, this data. But coming back to um, uh, the question that you asked about the food processing, about different cooking uh, processing, because there is a lot of information uh, in the literature, for example, how different cooking methods would uh, uh, particularly uh, influence uh, uh, certain types of molecules. Yeah. And you mentioned cabbage that we identify nine um, different types of molecules and how, for example, boiling or fermentation mm -hmm. would influence uh, their bioavailability uh, and, uh, and, uh, and their presence yeah. in the food. Uh, that information is partially available in uh, unstructured textual data in scientific articles, and that's why you need uh, tools like natural language processing basically to extract this information rather than doing experiments yourself. Of course, you ultimately have to do it, yeah. but given the uh, space we are talking about, even if you take uh, these 10 molecules and they want to uh, do uh, uh, experiments, uh, that would take you months or years actually to uh, elucidate how these different cooking methods would influence them. So, uh, this information, as I say, partially available in the literature, and that's why yeah. you need to uh, interrogate it using uh, natural language processing. Not as good as humans, uh, but at a scale that is not possible by humans. So we were talking a moment ago when we were saying all the different kind of factors, and one of them is the actual person consuming it. Mm -hmm. And that comes down to our genetics, our uh, um, gut, and the microbiome. Now, give us a bit of an insight into that. What, 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 uh, what is the influence of our microbiome on how we um, not only uh, is it important the foods that we eat, but it's obviously important how we digest them. And what role does the microbiome, what is the microbiome? Well, the microbiome is uh, uh, literally just the billions of uh, bugs, I mean, uh, living, uh, uh, living in our gut and the... Uh, uh, once we consume the food, I mean, that's uh, the first uh, uh, thing that happens that it interacts with our gut microbiome and it can change uh, uh, chemically uh, the molecules that we consume in the food and uh, making them different. So this downstream uh, consequence on, uh, on, on, on our health, but mm -hmm. also on our perception um, of, uh, of flavor uh, and, uh, and, uh, and taste. Uh, so food. the 
bacteria in our gut can influence how we perceive flavor. I personally think, uh, to a certain extent, uh, yes. Uh, Joseph, you need to double check that, <laughs> actually. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, it's uh, because chemically, I mean, they're changing uh, the chemical composition of the food we eat. And uh, as a result of that, uh, uh, it uh, interacts uh, ultimately with the so-called gut-brain axis. Yeah. Uh, and ultimately can uh, uh, can have uh, the downstream consequence of the way we perceive uh, hmm. and, and taste food as well. So, But microbiome is only a, a part of the puzzle and you need to think about your own genes and interactions with uh, genes in gut microbiome, but also environment that uh, you're eating food. So all these uh, parameters actually would uh, um, uh, influence your perception. So that's why... Uh, as part of uh, our uh, previous uh, ideas that we had uh, in the future, we envision a kind of food passport when you would have um, uh, the biochemical information, information about your gut microbiome, uh, about uh, your uh, different environmental factors that may influence yeah. your perception. And once you go to a restaurant, uh, then... Oh, well, that's interesting you bring that up, the whole idea of going to a restaurant, because when we talk about this idea of... Because um, you touched on the term precision nutrition earlier, and one of the topics that I want to talk about is actually a concept um, by a Japanese uh, design studio called Open Meals, and they are um, designing a restaurant concept called Sushi Singularity, and the idea being um, that the restaurant would create 3D-printed sushi by analyzing saliva, urine, and stool sample of diners um, so that the, the meals that they produce are tailored to um, the nutritional needs of the consumer. Do you think that's a realistic kind of, are we looking at a future where we send a stool sample ahead of our meal uh, before you, know, you make a reservation? Um, and, and send along a stool sample. I think that might be difficult if you're going for dinner with a big group, right? That That's might be good. messy. That, <laughs> might be, that might be messy. And, uh, sending you in and stool samples, I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely an interesting proposition. From our own research, uh, uh, we know, for example, that uh, in, in urine, uh, you can measure uh, uh, about a couple of hundreds of metabolites. We call it metabolic phenotype. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is reflective uh, of your genes and environment and gut microbiome uh, interactions. So that's why urine uh, provides a wealth uh, of information uh, about uh, personal individual biology. And it's very easy to access, uh, in a way, so just an yeah. example. Uh, I would personally not do it probably at this stage, but it's uh, definitely uh, an, 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 exciting, uh, an exciting and interesting proposition because you can potentially identify uh, the molecules that, as it mentioned, indicative of your gut microbiome activity. Yeah. Um, but you and I discussed this before, this idea that potentially you could have this food passport, something that has all this information on your kind of genetic predispositions mm -hmm. and um, kind of it could be varying levels of uh, kind of in-depth knowledge about you as an individual and um, your nutritional requirements, your likes, your dislikes, that you could send ahead to restaurants perhaps um, and that they would be able to take that into consideration. I think the point about 3D printing the food is maybe a bit kind of <laughs> uh, we're not quite there yet with that technology, but from an AI perspective or from um, a medical perspective, there's every chance that that is a possible future though, right? That we could actually be uh, having meals tailored to our individual personal needs. That seems to be this idea of precision nutrition seems to be uh, kind of a hot topic recently. Uh, and, uh, and and this is it. We know that one fits all diet doesn't work. So that's why I personally uh, think that it's, uh, uh, it's the future because even our, uh, from genetic point of view, we have different uh, risks of developing certain diseases. And uh, we know even from our own research that certain ingredients may have uh, more disease preventative potential than others. And for those individuals who are at risk, I want to be unfortunate enough to have uh, uh, predisposition to certain diseases because of the family, for example, then, of course, I mean, then uh, even at high level, when you go to a restaurant, 
you would prefer them to eat certain uh, ingredients that they have for health uh, benefits for these individuals. I mean, the question is, this is only one component. You yeah. also need to take into account the visual aesthetics and ultimately taste yeah. that this individual like because if you prepare a food healthy for them, but they don't like it, I mean, they would never come back to restaurants. Yeah. So that's why uh, this uh, idea of uh, uh, precision nutrition is there and it food ultimately uh, based on AI and machine learning technologies because the number of variables that we are talking about is humongous. I mean, you take, uh, uh, you say, genomes, you have 20,000 encoding proteins, uh, you have microbiome with uh, basically millions of genes from bugs as well that interact. Uh, so all these readouts, I mean, produce vast amount of data uh, and that you need to uh, interrogate and study interactions between these variables. And uh, that, uh, that is why you need uh, machine learning and to AI techniques uh, to uh, provide these uh, solutions. And I have to say that you can start at the higher level First, yeah. I mean, take into account uh, uh, a kind of phenotypic characteristics, I mean, mm-hmm. such as, for example, a disease profile, so the drugs you take, the ingredients you like, and go deeper and deeper into biological level to refine um, your uh, recommendation. So talking about precision nutrition, the idea that one size doesn't fit all, you and I earlier were discussing the uh, this world's largest scientific nutrition project um that's going on uh the between king's college london massachusetts general hospital and um the nutritional science company called zoe um they've shown that individual responses to the same foods are unique and i think one of the main interesting aspects is they've even shown that there are differences between twins that are genetically um identical so with research like that out there what, how is that going to influence perhaps how we make decisions about what to eat in the future? How is that going to have an impact if we start really understanding that as individuals, it's not only about the foods possessing certain properties, mm-hmm. but it's about us as individuals as well and how we actually metabolize these foods. Mm-hmm. How is that going to change um, maybe how we, how we make our food decisions going forward? And I think this is a, a, a truly exciting study. I mean, that uh, even in twins, I mean, they were able uh, to show that they respond uh, yeah. differently. I mean, to the same type of food. So it's a, the way they done it. Uh, I think they had the proxy measures, such as blood glucose level. I mean, that they monitored and uh, um, and and, uh, and normalized. And the, one of uh, the way of kind of going for it is maybe to using some proxy measures of uh, the disease processes, such as, for example, inflammatory markers, uh, and uh, that are easily accessible and measurable, and including blood glucose level and other parameters where you can uh, optimize how you respond, actually, to different types of food uh, based on these proxy markers. And uh, the fact that they show that uh, we need individualized and personalized solution um, it's uh, quite impressive because it's the same um, type of uh, food uh, they were given uh, and uh, uh, these twins have the same genetic composition, but they yeah. respond differently. And so does that mean that we could one day walk into, I don't know, West, uh, Waitrose, Tesco's, one of those kind of places and have certain foods for certain types of uh uh, people that you know your kind of uh, genetic uh, profile and that maybe they could it could be broken down in that way is that a possibility uh, or as we discussed when you come with your own food passports I mean then you basically and in the supermarket it's, yeah, it recommends it's, the it's foods recommends, that you should be eating yeah. along with the recipes perhaps to go with it this is it this is it and the along with the recipes and and cooking processes I mean that uh, um, uh, you, you you want to work with individual biology. Yeah. Um, of course, I mean, looking... Uh, prediction- Would there be great variances in terms of, you know, how... Di- how, and how much, am I right in thinking that about only 10 to 30% of our gut microbiome is shared? I think there's a... Our, right. 
is it something like 90 something percent of our um, DNA as human beings is pretty much the same? Yeah. But when it comes to but my, uh, gut microbiome, that that kind of number goes down to about only 10 to 30 percent on average is shared. Well, the diversity of microbiome, I don't know the exact numbers, unfortunately, but the diversity of the microbiome, given that uh, uh, we have so many different uh, uh, microorganisms and, and the viruses coexisting together, actually, it's, uh, it's, it's great. I don't know the percentage, to be honest, but uh, uh, they are more different from uh, gut microbiome or gut metagenome, you can call it, uh, point of view than from our own uh, genetic composition. Because as you mentioned, that between us, uh, we're largely, uh, it's only a small variance yeah. uh, that differentiate individuals. But when it comes to the gut microbiome, it's, it's a vast unexplored field, to be honest. Because I guess I'm interested because if you're a family, how do you, how does precision nutrition work when you have a family and you're not, you're cooking for more than one? How do you, could it be tweaked to take into consideration the different, let's say, users that you have sitting at the <laughs> dining table? And could there be meals that, uh, you know, although give you the, the, the nutrition that you require as an individual, you're still able, well, that it takes care of everyone who's at the table mm -hmm. without having to cook, let's say, three or four different meals. Um, and it's a partially optimization problem because it would be now a trade-off between yourself and uh, between a group of people. And you need to take into account not only your preferences and not only your uh, uh, profile, molecular profile, but also individual that share yeah. food with you. And it's a trade-off, I mean, because uh, it would not be, uh, it should be optimized now for a group of people. Yeah. And I think it ultimately comes down uh, to the ideas that we discuss, if you want to make food work for population level, that sometimes you need to optimize it um, for subgroups of individuals, uh, like you mentioned, stratify them into larger groups, because uh, I think providing personalized nutrition, I mean, it's an extremely exciting proposition, but it's going to be very expensive. Yeah. And even if you think about doing microbiome, uh, genomic measurements, we're talking about um, you know, thousands, if not tens of thousands of um, pounds for uh, different biological tests. So that would be quite, uh, uh, probably in the, in the long run, I mean, it would become cheaper and it would be possible. But at this stage, you need to think about how to optimize it that would work for subgroup of yeah. people. And, so, yeah. and would this be something that you'd constantly have to have analyzed, right? Because you couldn't just, you it would, your gut microbiome is constantly changing. changing. And so you would need, how often would you need to do these tests? Like, would it be, what, once a week, I, once a month, once I think a it's, year? An it's an open question. Oh, I mean, okay. It's, a, it's an open uh, question, and the, uh, but you need to monitor uh, the diversity of... Uh, so if you take, for example, urine tests, I mean, you can do it on a daily basis. And we know that the metabolically, I mean, um, you have day-to-day uh, -day variation. That's um, what we need is smart toilets. We have eye toilet, yes, I mean, smart toilet. <laughs> 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 we mean smart toilets that can analyze your waste. This is... Uh, well, that's a pretty good idea. That, that should happen, right? This mm. is... Uh, and uh, uh, I think it, it uh, well may happen in the future. I mean, that's... Uh, you get or could you have a smart toothbrush that analyzes your, your saliva? Would saliva be enough or does it have to be urine or...? I, or? I think saliva, by, it's another type of biofluids, it's providing another uh, type of uh, uh, biochemical measurements, I mean, that uh, uh, can be used. And in fact, I mean, for example... So would the more, more the better? So would it be better to have saliva and urine and feces and would all that, you know, be... Or would it be enough to have one? I wish I would know the answer to that question because uh, uh, ultimately you need to basically collect these uh, uh, different types of data and, and then find out what variables actually are the most okay. important ones. So again, I think it's uh, you need to interrogate the data, you need to um, uh, get uh, uh, the questions. It's, it depends what uh, you want to predict, for example, okay. as well. Um, so it uh, does need, I mean, there needs to be a proper research and development, I think, in this field. And we just, uh, as I said in the beginning, so different uh, pieces of information are being collected by different individuals, different research groups, or different companies. Yeah. Uh, but I think one of the future directions is how we can combine these different types of data and find out what pieces in of information actually are the most valuable okay. in a way so we can scale it up for population level rather than 
uh, for individuals. And so what can this be used for? We know, because um, we've discussed this, and this is part of what we'll talk about in a bit with hyperfoods, but the idea of optimizing people's diet if, let's say, they're undergoing a certain type of therapy or um, uh, uh, treatment for a disease or illness that you know you can optimize their diet. Um, I think what else... So other than, let's say, overcoming diseases, there's preventative, I guess, eating. So eating a diet that would help you with uh, reducing the possibility or likelihood. Mm -hmm. um, we said there were diets that would help if you're undergoing certain kind of treatments. Mm -hmm. What else could we do with this? What else? What other opportunities are there? Well, I think the opportunities uh, this, 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 this food are, are extremely, extremely large because I believe that food is uh, one of the biggest uh, modifiable factors that we as individuals can change. And that's why we need to have a smart companion uh, yeah. in, in a way. Uh, and uh, because there is so much reading about nutrition research and so much exciting stuff being done thus far, but it's not uh, aggregated, it's not uh, systematically analyzed. Uh, because of the uh, vast amount of information. And I think that's where machine learning and AI techniques can help to navigate through this uh, vast knowledge base to help you make uh, uh, smart nutrition choices on a day-to-day -day basis. And I have to say, we got, uh, we got it completely wrong, I think, over the 30 years. Uh, the recent data illustrated uh, about 80% uh, of uh, uh, adult population in, in the UK are expected to be uh, obese or overweight according to BMI index uh, uh, in 2020. Uh, so Sorry, uh, say that again, by 2020? 20, we expect to have eight out of 10 adult men to be uh, overweight or obese. In the UK? In, in, in the UK now, it's about 65 to 70%. Uh, and wow. the seven out of 10 adult women are expected to be uh, obese as well. So it's people sometimes talking not about obese anymore, but super obese, I mean, <laughs> very big individuals. And uh, we know that uh, uh, obesity and uh, associated with uh, risk of developing cancers, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, and as, a, and as a result, we have very un unhealthy uh, population. And uh, if you want to be really pragmatic from an economic point of view, uh, it's a massive uh, economic opportunity lost uh, because uh, human capital is considered one of the driving force of developing economies. Yeah. And unfortunately, uh, because of the different complications of the disease, these individuals are not as productive as healthy ones. So from fundamental point of view, you need to think about the smart nutrition, uh, uh, like we discussed, food passport and AI technologies that would help the individual to predict its journey. I mean, if it continues to eat like that, I mean, what would happen to you in five or 10 years down the line? Yeah. The problem you would have, maybe that would stop individuals actually uh, 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 consuming uh, some of uh, uh, negative uh, uh, not negative foods, but uh, on, a, on a bad dietary habits and yeah. bring them back to kind of healthy dietary trajectory. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that's where we need a, a collaboration uh, between uh, the uh, particularly chefs and uh, sensory uh, gastronomy, uh, how we can design uh, the foods that not only taste good, uh, not only, sorry, have health benefits but also taste good and look good so yeah. they would appeal uh, for the majority foods that people actually want to eat rather than just foods that are labeled as healthy and people constantly feel like they're compromising with yeah exactly i mean yeah. like think about brussels sprouts for example i mean <laughs> who else wants to eat them I mean, oh i love brussels sprouts <laughs> you know? and uh, but coming back to kind of therapeutic point of view uh, i visited a good friend of mine uh, Dr. Reza Mizami, who is a surgeon in University College uh, Hospital of London, and when you uh, look at what people eat uh, at this uh, truly uh, outstanding hospital, it's quite uh, scary, to be honest. I mean, we call it the so-called bending menu. <laughs> they eat from bending machines, and they're already in compromised uh, state. I mean, Sorry, this is the patients or the, the this doctors? This is the patients, yeah. Wow. It's uh, both, actually, I mean, probably, <laughs> because... Uh, um, they don't have a lot of choice, uh, but the, currently the food that is served uh, to patients, uh, it's uh, also of, uh, uh, not uh, uh, good quality, as I said, from vending machines, and therefore they're already uh, being 
compromise. And on top of that, uh, some of the uh, positive effect of therapy, I mean, probably to a certain extent uh, is um, negatively affected by the food they eat. Uh, yeah. So that's why from that point of view as well, what uh, we've discussed together actually, it's how we can in the future uh, design uh, next generation foods that would work with your therapy. And uh, example in cancer, for example, that would be food that uh, mediate your inflammatory response, for example, reduce inflammation would be just uh, one. Uh, so foods, a diet that would actually be prescribed along with your um, medicine. So or your treatment, so a menu or a diet that would actually work to enhance the effects, or, or um, is that what it would do? Uh, it's uh, maybe uh, not only enhance the effect, but maybe to reduce some of the side effects as well of um, of the therapy. You can I think. And you were telling me that there are foods that you can eat as well that would actually be counterproductive to your treatment as well, right? Or there's the possibility that there are certain things if you have certain. Um, if you're being treated for a certain disease, there's a possibility that there could be things in your diet that you're eating that are actually having a counterproductive effect. Yes, I mean, and the, the classical uh, example is uh, this so-called junk or unhealthy food because, uh, for example, as part of the cancer, you have uh, 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 an inflammatory state, so there is a lot of uh, inflammation, and as part of that, you can exaggerate it using... Uh, um, uh, this uh, unhealthy food, mm. uh, whereas with the positive, uh, with the healthy, with the healthy ones, uh, uh, you can potentially uh, reduce inflammation and therefore potentially improve uh, an outcome of cancer. Of course, it has to be ultimately evidence based, and you need to design uh, randomized uh, controlled trials to uh, show systematic uh, effects. So you need to subdivide your population into uh, random groups. I mean, one the given. Uh, a kind of a healthy diet or the yeah. diet based on hyperfoods, as we discussed, and the other one is a control case, and you need to show systematically that uh, um, the outcome of patients are improved. The outcome can be long-term survival or the proxy markers that you measure in the blood that were, uh, uh, for example, indicative of an inflammatory state if it comes to mm -hmm. uh, cancer. But we also know that certain foods interact with drugs, and this is the classical example of grapefruit juice, for example, it's, uh, it interacts with the cytochrome P450 enzymes, I mean, that are responsible for uh, drug metabolism, and as a result of that, you may have actually higher concentration of the drug in your uh, bloodstream, and it can cause toxicity. Uh, side oh, effects. Wow. So this is just one example, but there are so many interactions actually that um, you can that uh, currently not take into account. Yeah. And in fact, in uh, from our own uh, paper, one of the things that we discussed uh, uh, it's uh, how we can from the molecules that we identify, and of course, by availability need to be taken into account. But they can interact at kind of two levels. I mean, one it's interaction with pharmacokinetics of the drugs and drug metabolism it's, it's, it's itself. Mm -hmm. And the other one, it's uh, targeting pathways that are targeted by the drugs as well. So it's pharmacodynamics. It's, uh, and they can basically compete at both levels. And uh, these interactions are not currently uh, uh, taken into account, but uh, they may uh, influence uh, uh, drug uh, uh, therapy or therapeutic response of an individual. Because right now in the UK, doctors receive absolutely no uh, nutritional training, right? And I think we've both spoken to um, practice, practitioners and clinicians and people who work in that space and who will tell you that when people are diagnosed with quite a serious um, illness um, along the lines of cancer, that one of the first questions they'll ask is, what should I eat? And that's actually, they really don't have other than just general kind of guidelines of, you know, eat um, a varied diet, lots of fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. and get your five a day kind of thing that they don't really have any in-depth um, knowledge to be able to help people with the nutrition. But based on what you're saying, that's actually a massively important part of um, the drug interaction uh, or the effectiveness of the drugs that people are taking, right? It's both during the therapy and prior to therapy as well, because uh, when it comes to cancer, it's, uh, uh, as we discussed before, uh, 30 to 40 percent of all cancers are actually preventable by dietary and lifestyle changes alone. So 
I would say that you need a kind of dietitian advice long before you have uh, the disease process itself. I mean, hopefully for preventative yeah. uh, interventions uh, first. Well, schools uh, would be a good place to start. Schools would be an excellent place <laughs> to start because that's where I think uh, the majority of current uh, advice uh, gone completely wrong given the rise of uh, uh, obesity, the levels of obesity yeah. uh, among children. So, um, yes, a short answer uh, it's uh, that you need to take into account and uh, now often you have uh, an advice of uh, dietitians, uh, but it's not usually part of your treatment plan. Yeah. And uh, therefore, uh, you need to, uh, with the uh, AI and machine learning, you can... Uh, take the knowledge that are currently accumulated uh, and and spread it out to population uh, rather than uh, having a, a one-to-one advice. I mean, which is uh, obviously a choice at the moment, but given that there, is, uh, um, that there is a low number of dietitians yeah. uh, in uh, Western world, unfortunately, uh, that you need to develop a smart companion that would help you to make choices uh, day-to-day and at least point out that there are certain uh, interactions based on available uh, evidence uh, data. So you mentioned uh, the paper that you've recently published and um, the idea of hyperfoods. You've mentioned that a couple of times. You're working on the Dream Lab project that's funded by Vodafone, and you've just published this paper on hyperfoods. Just talk us through that very quickly. Sure. Uh, I have to say that we've published it uh, together and uh, with <laughs> your... <laughs> Uh, inputs, uh, so it's a it's a truly team effort, and uh, uh, the projects that uh, uh, I'm currently uh, leading uh, uh, with the Vodafone Foundation, the idea is to uh, use the processing power of uh, thousands of smartphones uh, to create a, a virtual supercomputer yeah. uh, to crunch uh, molecular uh, data to uh, identify. Uh, new uh, indications of existing drugs and find drug-like molecules in food uh, that they have some disease-beating properties. Mm-hmm. And, and what do we mean by disease-beating properties? Why, how do you know that these ingredients have disease? What, what is it about them? Uh, the way we did it in uh, our uh, manuscript is uh, we've used the existing therapies uh, uh, and existing drugs actually to learn the uh, molecular networks that uh, are targeted by those molecules. Yeah. Uh, because any disease process uh, uh, can be uh, simplified to um, uh, a process of interactions with the uh, human uh, molecular networks okay. that are responsible for different uh, biological processes. And so we identified, so once we've um, uh, analyzed the existing therapeutics uh, in cancer, uh, using uh, uh, AI techniques uh, that uh, we use to simulate uh, how the therapeutics uh, affect uh, human uh, uh, biological processes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, we learned uh, what biological processes are target, targeted by existing therapeutics. Okay. Uh, and we we're able uh, with a classification... And by medicine. therapeutics, we're talking about pharmaceutical drugs. Yeah, we, that, we're talking about pharmaceutical uh, drugs because they're designed... Uh, to target uh, disease uh, yeah. processes uh, in cancer. It can be, for example, cell cycle, uh, P453, for, uh, for example, uh, signaling processes, uh, jack stat pathways, and others. So okay. there's an, a, a multitude of pathways. And uh, once we've um, uh, uh, validated the, the model, uh, we showed that it was uh, able to accurately predict uh, uh, existing candy-candy therapeutics based on the influence on molecular networks. So nine out of 10 drugs were accurately predicted. Um, and then we took the model and processes uh, and, and, and process uh, uh, thousands of uh, uh, known uh, uh, bioactive molecules in food yeah. to identify uh, which one of them have uh, the highest uh, anti-cancer drug likeness. Uh, okay. And we identify about 100. So it's identifying the same molecules that you were looking for in the drugs and identifying them in foods. Uh, It's not uh, because they're coming from different molecular classes, but they target uh, the same biological processes. So that's different because we didn't uh, do it based on the chemical structure similarity, but rather than how they interact uh, with biological processes. 
and uh, we identified 110 uh, molecules from different uh, chemical classes that have they had the highest anti-cancer likeness, drug likeness. And uh, then we, uh, using multiple experimental databases, we map them into different food sources or different ingredients to identify which ones uh, from theoretical point of view. Yeah. Theoretical point of view, I mean, uh, the number of different types of molecules that have cancer beating properties uh, have uh, the highest cancer uh, beating potential. And as you mentioned, cabbage was one of them, where we identify about nine uh, different types of molecules that target different... And now you drink uh, cabbage smoothies. And, and now <laughs> I, every morning I drink uh, cabbage uh, <laughs> smoothies. It's part of my, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's part of my dietary plan. Uh, but also there were, uh, what's exciting that uh, there was a whole diversity uh, of molecules and uh, I would encourage people just to go and look at our food map because we actually clustered them according to their molecular composition as well. Yeah. And uh, so ultimately, uh, you need to study how the, all these molecules interact uh, with each other uh, to produce uh, uh, the uh, effect of uh, interest. Uh, there are a lot of limitations of the study because we have not taken the bioavailability uh, of molecules into account, so they may not be present in uh, high enough concentrations. That's so, why. So we're saying that cabbage can have nine different types of cancer-beating molecules, but it depends on where that cabbage is coming from, and it depends on each cabbage may have different levels of concentrations of those compounds in it, and depending, obviously, then what we were talking about earlier, how you cook it, how you process it, and so on, that will also be uh, determine how effective those compounds are. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, this is the case because... Uh, uh, for example, the one, the, if you take the cabbage that is organically grown, I don't know, in California, and the one that grown, I don't know, in greenhouse in China, <laughs> I mean, uh, the chemical yeah. composition uh, uh, would be uh, different. And, and as a result uh, of that, uh, the positive pro-health effects uh, may be quite different. So that's why uh, this needs to be properly investigated using mm. experimental methods, actually, how we can um, optimize uh, the uh, cultivation, uh, the uh, cooking processes to maximize uh, the uh, 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 nutrition uh, value and uh, molecules that have potentially uh, uh, health benefits on the on individual. Uh, but it's quite a complex and uh, and, and difficult uh, path, I have to say, and uh, a lot of further uh, clinical validations are required actually to confirm. Uh, these effects, but I think what differentiate our study from um, uh, other studies in nutrition that uh, uh, they mainly focus, although of really good quality, but they mainly focus on individual component or individual food. What we've demonstrated that there are basically hundreds of different molecules, and uh, hmm. uh, that and if you control only uh, like a certain uh, say food. Uh, like consumption of apple, for example, it's only yeah. one part of the story. So you need to think of the whole dietary pattern because there are basically hundreds of different things that interact. And if you control only one of them and left the, and, and leave others to kind of float around, I mean, yeah. then it would be very difficult to see any. Uh, and could certain things. combinations of food have an additive or subtractive effect on each other? So maybe, you know, cabbage is great. Cabbage and garlic is even better cabbage and I don't know, uh, something else could be less effective. Could that, could it work like that as well? Uh, certainly yes. And uh, 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 there can be a synergetic effect. I mean, that when they enhance each other and uh, uh, given there are different types of molecules on them, or there can be uh, a, a negative effect where they cancel each other. Uh, again, that uh, requires a large-scale simulations, yeah. and uh, which would be very difficult uh, to address the experimental methods alone. So you need to do large-scale simulations first uh, to see, and after that, confirm using experimental uh, uh, methods. Because uh, say we analyze about 10,000 of molecules. So if yeah. you can see there were three molecules in combination, three molecules in, out of 10,000, that's about one trillion possibilities. Yeah, that's okay, when you put it that way, that's why you need AI. So <laughs> it's uh, impossible using, uh, uh, one of the quotations that we use, uh, it's like using a bike to explore the galaxy. I mean, if you want to just rely on experimental methods alone. So you need uh, uh, a smarter way 
of designing uh, experimental studies uh, in the future and AI and machine learning can help with that, sure. And talk about smarter ways of doing things. So one final question that I have for you, one final topic that I'd like to kind of pick your brain about. In our world of uh, food and gastronomy, food waste is a growing concern along with kind of, um, you know, uh, malnutrition and, and food security. These are probably, you know, um, the kind of hot topics at the moment when we're looking at a growing uh, population reaching that 9 billion. We already have a billion people around the world who are going hungry or are malnourished um, and kind of looking at, um, you know, looking at solutions for this. Now, it's estimated that, um, you know, I think it's somewhere in the range of, what was it, 82 billion tons of waste, food waste in, is generated in the EU. The UK is pretty high up there on the list in terms of, um, I know about, it's estimated about a third of all the food that we buy at home. <clears throat> sorry, that a f about a third of all the food that we buy at home actually ends up going to the bin. That could be because it's gone past its sell-by days, or it could be because you've cooked it and just haven't eaten it and it's gone rotten or whatever it may be. And um, it's estimated about 4.2 million tons um, of food that's thrown away in the UK by homes is actually fine to eat, but because it's gone past its expiry date, we throw it out. So anyway, my question to you is all kind of the, 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 the thought that I have in mind is, how could AI help with curbing food waste? Is there room for AI? I mean, it's there, as we said, you know, at the beginning, we were talking about food and uh, AI in agriculture. We know it's uh, definitely present when it comes to, um, you know, uh, the, the uh, transport of food and all the way down <clears throat> the food chain, we've got technology and AI specifically being kind of heavily brought into it. Food waste, there must be a way, right, of getting AI to help us with overcoming this problem. Well, as you said that uh, we currently have about 1 billion uh, people who are hungry or, or malnourished, but on the other hand, in uh, Western world, we have uh, a, a huge uh, uh, food waste and uh, and the growing, and, and growing uh, uh, obesity uh, levels. So this is a, a partially an optimization problem. It's how you can redistribute uh, the food in a way that uh, to maximize uh, the effect of, of, on any individual on the planet. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is that you need to look at the global ecosystem then uh, at, uh, at, at the planet as a whole and how you can work between the governments. So, uh, and uh, the computational solutions uh, can potentially uh, AI uh, uh, solutions can potentially find the most op uh, the, the optimal routes. I mean, how you can redistribute this food so in in a way that uh, everybody benefits and 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 there is uh, less uh, food waste. So we need a global uh, we need a global solution. Could we find it within countries as well? Could we find a way of uh, uh, kind of redistributing food in a more optimal way? Because I'm guessing in the UK. We're a developed country, but there's still a lot of people who are malnourished. Would AI be able to help in that sense? Uh, as soon as you have uh, smart sensors, I mean, that can monitor, I mean, where the food waste is generated, and yeah. uh, where the demand is, uh, then you can think about the optimization problem I and mean, how you can redistribute the food in a way that uh, it, it will reach uh, uh, the people who actually need it. Uh, so ultimately, it comes down to optimization, and if there is a will, uh, there would be a solution in place. Uh, but it does require that the individuals uh, and uh, and uh, I think policymakers working together uh, to see uh, how we can uh, first of all produce uh, the food in a way that uh, there is a uh, less waste generated yeah. uh, on the first place, so people actually eat the food they buy. Uh, and secondly, it's uh, uh, how we can redistribute it in a way that uh, this waste actually bring to individuals who are uh, in need for that. Awesome. Kirill, it's been amazing having you in the studio. Thank you so much for giving us an idea on artificial intelligence and its impact that it's going to have on gastronomy. Thank you so much. 
Joseph, uh, pleasure to be here. I have to say that I'm not an expert in all this field, so I do apologize if I... <laughs> 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 Neither one of us is an expert, but no, it's great to discuss. No, it's great to pick your brain and have your thoughts on all of this. Thank you so much. Great. Great to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity as well.